Okay, take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I almost preached this week on Romans 8, 28. That's what I thought about, and I changed my mind about it. Because I think the pandemic's already got enough <laughs> publicity. Listen, God has this thing under control. I'll just say that. I mean, I, all things are working together for good. It doesn't mean everything's good. Uh, I, and, and I would dare say with a massive amount of people that have died worldwide, there have probably been some true justified saints have died from COVID. Maybe so, maybe not. Long and the short of it is if they died, they died in the Lord, thankfully. And they went truly to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. But, you know, there's no guarantee that everything's always going to be smooth in our lives. We know that to be the case. But here's the thing we also know. Our lives do not revolve around what goes on down here in this present world. We have to live here. But I tell you, one of the things that, that I think I am coming to grips with more and more that our Lord continually teaches me every single day when I wake up again, and I take that first breath when I sit up on the side of the bed in the morning. I realize more and more this place is not my home. And I stay here. And I live here. And I go through this life. And I love the things of this life. I do. I'd be lying if I said I just detest everything. I love my kids. I, I love my granddaughter. I love my wife. I, I love this church family. I love being able to come up here and meet with people. I love preaching the gospel. I can't envision a time when I don't preach the gospel. But all these things, folks, are of the earth earthy. Ultimately, all these things, either through death or old age or tragedy, they're going to all come to an end. But this thing that we're talking about, this, this thing of salvation, this thing of eternal life, this thing of eternal blessedness in Christ Jesus our Lord, it is eternal in nature. You cannot take that from the child of God. We have a good hope through grace, do we not? We have a blessed hope that no man can take from us. Yet in this world, we deal with it. And I'm on, I think, Lord willing, hopefully I've been working on it now for almost a month. I told Bill the other day, I have tried for four weeks to start a series on Romans 7. And I, Lord willing, I'm going to get it started and do it next week. And in four weeks of studying and preparing, I've wrote a paragraph and a half. Now, that's all I get done. But I think this can be a springboard back to Romans chapter 7. We are in a warfare. I hear people say all the time, I'm in a warfare. Listen, people who do not believe this gospel, they're not in a warfare. Now, they might be wrestling with their own consciences, but they're not in the battle. You've you got to know Christ to be in the battle. Or better than that, Christ has, you have to be known of God to be in the battle. He has to have created Christ in you, the hope of glory, before you ever get engaged in this thing. Before that, all, the, the, all that, the armor of Christ, it's of no avail to an unbeliever. Gives him no necessity, no help, no comfort, no peace, no security. And you know, here's the thing. We, we, in this world, as long as we live here, we're going to face this struggle, this inward struggle against sin, against the flesh, against the world, and against the devil. It's just going to be there. I wish it were not so. But I tell you what, even to make that kind of a statement is a slap in the face of our God. Because if it were not meant to be so, it would not be so. If it was better for me for that old nature to be gone, don't you think God would have took it away? So there's something there for us. But look at this verse that we're going to look at this morning. I've entitled this message, The Law That Set Me Free. People say, oh, no, the law can't set anybody free. Well, hold on. We're going to talk about this this morning. The law that set me free. Notice what he says. We'll read verse 1 and 2 together. Therefore, there he is, is in italics, so it wasn't in the original. Therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And if you, if you know anything about the original, that phrase, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, was actually not in the original translation. So this verse really reads, Therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For, here's our text this morning, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. See that? 
hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, I know, and I, I've dealt with people all these times. People run to extremes. The, the, the natural mind receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerning. The natural mind reads something like this, or they hear this message that I'm going to preach this morning. I, I know I've got friends and I've got family that listen to me, and I'll guarantee you in their unregenerate state, they might be moral, sincere, dedicated, committed, just like I've told you before. In Charlie Brown's Halloween and Christmas, when the teacher's standing up there at the front, what do they hear? Womp, 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 womp. They'll hear, and in their mind, as I tell you what the Word of God tells you and me as God's children, those redeemed and justified through the blood and righteousness of Lord Jesus Christ, their unregenerate mind hears, He's saying you can do whatever you want to do. Now, that's just the way they look at it. And here's the thing, I know that there is a danger that sinners will abuse the truth of full, free, eternal justification through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that. That's not my concern. I could care less the way the goats misrepresent and misinterpret the truth that I'm going to set before you this morning. Listen to Paul, Peter's word. He says this, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found in him, of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Paul's written to these same people that Peter's writing to. And he says this, as also in all his epistles, one of them being Romans, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction yet you therefore beloved see you know these things before beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him be glory both now and forever amen as a gospel preacher and as a fellow believer, you know what my main concern is? My main concern is the comfort and encouragement of all God's elect as we travel through this earthly plane that we live in. That's what I want. That's my goal. And see, Isaiah clearly stated that design and goal for the gospel preacher in every generation. What did he say? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. Speak ye comfortably unto Jerusalem and cry unto her. What are you to cry, Pastor? That her warfare is accomplished. That her iniquity is not in the position of being pardoned. What is it, Kenny? It's pardoned. For she hath received already, received, past in, of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Well, hold it. Folks, if God dealt with me based on what I did this morning, I would be a beat-up piece of pub, wouldn't I? But he says, I've received double. How is this? I received it in Christ my head. Everything that was required of me, what did God do? He required it of him, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me be perfectly clear on this matter. If you're listening to me this morning out there on Sermon Audio, you're sitting here in front of me this morning. And you claim that you believe the gospel of God's free grace. And you're resting and relying upon Christ. And you even claim Christ is the Lord your righteousness. If you seek to use words like what Isaiah wrote there in Isaiah chapter 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Or you seek to use a verse like this one that we're going to look at this morning here in Romans chapter 8 verse 2. If you seek to use it as, as an excuse 
or to li as liberty to live like you want to? To do what you please? I tell you, folks, the long and the short of it is this. You are yet in your sins and you are alienated from God in your mind presently. But on the other hand, if you're here this morning or you're listening to me this morning and you're a justified saint, having rested in Christ as the Lord your righteousness, and you are struggling and you are laboring and you are heavy laden with sin every day of your life, I hope these words that Paul gives us concerning the believer's freedom and liberty in Christ, the Lord will be pleased to use them to comfort your soul in that trouble hour because we need comfort, don't we? Well, let's begin. Notice what he says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The apostle Paul used the word for begin this verse which indicates to you and me kind of like the word therefore therefore it indicates to us that whatever he's about to write whatever he's about to say is connected to and is the explanation of what he said immediately before so what did he say immediately before at Romans 8 2 therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Do you think God meant that? I, I, I said this for almost 33 years now. I've studied through the book of Romans and preached through the book of Romans probably four or five times, verse by verse through the whole chapter. And I've told you in the past that God the Holy Spirit started this glorious chapter. Everybody wants to zero in on Romans chapter 8, verse 28. They want to talk about Romans 8, one, But most of the people don't really believe that, that that blessing is actually there. They think it's conditional. But for the child of God, the elect of God, this verse, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Paul starts out by telling us in this glorious chapter, that he's going to tell us how we get there in Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. It's all according to God's sovereign will and purpose. But he starts out this glorious chapter telling God's children, there is no condemnation. Absolutely. I mean this. There is none, not any possibility of condemnation in any way, to any degree, based on anything to the child of God. And he ends this chapter the same way. He talk, starts out talking about there's no possibility of condemnation, and he ends this chapter what? Listen to this. There's no possibility of separation. He said, for I am persuaded, verse 38 and 39 of Romans chapter 8, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature. Listen to this. In other words, nothing in this world can do what? Can separate us from the love of God. Why? Why? Because of this last statement that he makes. This love of God isn't in me. It's love of God which is where? It is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So starting here in verse 2. With this simple word for. And continuing down through verse 4. The apostle is explaining how. There is no possibility of condemnation to any God redeemed can be true. How can that be true? Well, Paul uses a very interesting phrase to define the gospel. What he, think about how he says it. He says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He calls it a law. He calls it a law. Now, a lot of people, they say that this phrase that Paul uses here for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus they say that this phrase that he used here is teaching you and me the commanding influence of the Holy Spirit in the sanctification or in the progressive holiness of the believer. Well, that, I tell you, first of all, that idea is just not supported by the context of this scripture, and it's not supported by the entirety of the Word of God. Paul's main point in verse 1 was the fact 
that to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those that God chose in the everlasting covenant of grace, to those whom Christ represented by his very obedience unto death, there is no possibility of condemnation, period. So that begs this question. Why is there no possibility of condemnation? Is it because the believer is sanctified or in the process of becoming progressively more holy and Christ-like in their character and conduct? That can't be true. And the reason that there's no condemnation is listen, it's because that every believer is united to the Lord Jesus Christ and has been freed from its curse and from its law. Look back at chapter 7. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are, doesn't say becoming, you are become dead to the law. And that word dead there is necros. And it means what? It means graveyard dead. You're dead to the law. How are we dead to the law? By the body of Christ. That you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Think about it. It couldn't be true that believing sinners are delivered from the law that is in, in them with respect to their sanctification because if that's the case, that would contradict the exact same thing Paul's written about in the previous chapter concerning the internal struggle that every believer Believer presently endures even the Apostle Paul and from which Paul himself and we ourselves what do we look for we look for deliverance how did he end the chapter before oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord so then with the mind I myself serve the law but with the flesh what do we serve we serve the law of sin so what's the meaning of Paul's words here when he uses this word law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, especially since through this law believers are guaranteed by God that there's no possibility of condemnation. Well, you know, there's no doubt that the scriptures use the word law in a variety of different ways. I know that. But here's the thing. In every case, the meaning of the word is determined by the context. That's so important when we study God's word. Because, see, most people, when they're studying the Scriptures and they see the law, what's the first law that pops into their mind? Huh? They think about the old Mosaic law, that law of Moses. It goes back to that. They think of the moral law. They, most people, when they think of the law, they know what they think about. They don't even think about the, the ceremonial law or the priesthood. What do they think about? The, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. That can't be the case in the context of this verse because, listen, Paul, whatever this law is, he contrasts it, he contrasts that law that has set us free with what he calls the law of sin and death. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So the law in this part of this verse, what's it referring to? It's referring to the gospel that declares and sets forth the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, of this law, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, what's revealed? The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And if you connect this with what Paul wrote in Romans 10, verse 4, it makes it very clear that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets sinners free is none other than God's gospel preached, heard, understood, believed in, and rested upon by God-given faith. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every man that believes. This word is translated law. You know what it actually means in the original? It means a rule or principle producing a state approved of God. Let that sink in a minute. A rule or principle producing a state approved of God. And this state of approval before God, this law that he's talked about, it's attributed to who? The law of the 
spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What's the spirit's job? Huh? No. 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 Healing? No. Nope. What's, his, what's his job? He, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll take the things that are mine, and what will he do? He'll reveal them unto you. How do we know it's the Holy Spirit that's dealing with us? Who does he speak of? Who does he declare? Who does he push to the forefront? If he promotes himself, what is he? He's another spirit. But if he exalts and honors and magnifies the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know it's the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you think about it. The gospel itself is called the Spirit as being administered by the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, what's that? That's the moral law given by angels to, the, to, to Moses the mediator. And he said well, it was glorious. No doubt about it. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, the law is just, holy, just, perfect, and good, right? He said it was glorious so that the children of Israel, and I always think about this, when he came down off that moat and mountain, what did they say? He had to cover his face because they couldn't look on him. Children of God could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. But listen to this caveat, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth it. What's the Spirit minister? The ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory which excelleth. For if that which is done away with glory was glorious, much more that which remaineth more glorious. This law is called the law of the spirit and life because the administration of this law, what does it always result in? It always results in life, spiritual life. It always results in the exact opposite of what the moral law always accomplished. Listen to you. Who also hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Listen to this. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit, oh, the Spirit, that Holy Spirit of Christ, the Spirit giveth life. See, this spiritual life is the opposite of spiritual death which all sinners exist in by nature. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. That word quickeneth means to be made alive. Ezekiel wrote, I will put my spirit in you. And if he puts his spirit in you, what's the result? You shall live. He don't spark us up and hope that we'll get up on our legs and walk. When God, when Christ, you know, every miracle our Lord did, when he performed it, it was complete. When he told that man, stretch forth the arm, it wasn't one of these. You know, he didn't have to, have to exercise and get it. to. It was perfect. The woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment, healed totally and completely. When he gives life, folks, it's eternal and it's unchangeable. And see, every person is given the principle of natural life in Adam. Matter of fact, Paul said that Jesus Christ is the life source of all creatures. For in him we live and move and have our very being. But in contrast, those who are born from above, born by the Spirit of God through the, this law, through this principle, they are given heavenly and spiritual life. The life referred to is that life that we receive through the gospel is the law or the power of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which the apostle calls the life of God. Listen to what Paul said to those at Colossus. When Christ, our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. So the life of the Spirit, that the Spirit gives to God's elect in each generation is life purchased and it's life accomplished through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that brings me to the last part of this verse. 
And I want to make a few more points and I'll stop. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, if you don't get anything else this morning, you get this. The thing that a believer, a justified saint, has to take away from this word is the total liberty and total liberation from the law of sin and death. Now, we could go back, we could make a long, long message on what he said. You're not under law. You're under grace. But here's the thing I find so amazing. Words are amazing things, especially when we get back to the original language. And what so I find out so, find so amazing about the way that he states this particular verse is this phrase that he uses here for hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The word translated hath made in English, and the word translated free. It says hath made me free. The word hath made and the word free. You know what they are? They're the same Greek word. The same exact way were stated before the word me and after the word me. In both cases, the word made free and the word hath made and the word free, it means to set at liberty or to make free. So what he says, basically, if you want to read this the way it's originally written, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me, set it, set at liberty, made me free, me, made me free. In other words, it's, it's kind of like comfort ye, comfort ye, my peace. It's a double. Like when our Lord said, verily, verily, I say unto you. In other words, he's emphasizing to you, me, you and me the importance of our freedom and liberty in Christ Jesus. So Paul wrote of himself, which includes every elect and every generation. This is what he's saying. The gospel, which is the declaration of life and righteousness through and by the person and work of the God-sent Messiah, hath removed forever. The guilt, penalty, condemnation which the law of Moses imposed on all, including God's elect, we're free. Think about it. In Romans 7, verse 24, Paul cried out, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Every one of us here this morning, everybody that's listening to my voice, our old human body was made to be a body of death. It started dying the minute we were born. Because God's law requires from this, from this humanity, what does it require? Perfect obedience. Thought, word, and deed from the cradle to the grave. And the least infraction of God's law, what does it require? Why am I dying? Huh? Yeah, I read not too long ago that a 22-month-old baby that had been born down in New Orleans had died, had died from the COVID. The mother had gone into premature labor and the baby was born. You know, why, do, why do babies die? You ever thought about that? Why do they die? What are they? I know, I know we all look at our grandkids and we think, well, they're sweet little things. What are they by nature? There's no sin, no death. That teaches us about the nature of man now. If there was no sin, folks, there'd be no death. So all of us are in this body of death because God requires perfect satisfaction. But in this verse, Paul gives us the answer. What does he tell us? What's the answer for this law of sin and death? The righteousness of God, which is only declared one place through the gospel. And it's called a law because it's delivered you and me, Paul and us, to ourselves forever from any condemnation. David said it best. The law of the Lord, perfect. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. Law of the Lord, perfect. Because the law can't save anybody. We know that from the New Testament, right? No man can be justified by the law. Paul says you are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Law of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, sure. And I like this, making wise the simple. Don't you know? Every believer should take to themselves all the consolation of this verse. All of it. It's our responsibility. I told you, I've been telling you as long as I've known you, as long as I've preached to God, these promises are written down for a reason. It's our responsibility to study them and by God-given faith enter into them. Now listen, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 
You believe that? It's not just a wish. It's not a desire, but it's the statement and belief of a fact that God's Word declares, and He declares it that way for your comfort and your security in His present evil world. But here's the thing that I find so sad about this. Most believers, most justified saints, most of God's redeemed, when they talk about the freedom and liberty that, that we've been given, they'd say, you know, I, I, I'd be happy if I could. Gladly enter into what Paul's talking about. Rejoice in them. But I've got a problem. What assurance can I have that all these blessings are truly mine, that I'm free from condemnation, and that I'm truly in Christ, since in my life, what do I see? And what do I feel? That's the key to it right there. The just don't live by sight. What do we live? We live by faith. How can I get beyond that? Well, listen, if you're satisfied with your condition and you're satisfied with your sin and you're, you're pleased with the fact that you can follow your evil desires to your whims desire, have no desire to turn from them, you have no ground to claim the promise of this blessing here. But I tell you, if you see yourself struggling, laboring and heavy laden, always coming short, failing to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, failing to love your neighbor as yourself, if you groan on account of your own sinfulness and your own remaining rebellion and you cry out like the Apostle Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, this promise is yours. That's who it's to. Our desire should be what? To be holy in every area of our lives. But the sad thing of it is what? We're not that way. Thank God for his mercy and for his grace. When we think about it, think about it like this. We'll close with this statement this morning. Christ said to those Jews that stood there with him in John chapter 8, which believed on him. John chapter 8 tells us that they believed on him. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. Because this, they believed in him, but they had not believed on him. They had not believed on him as the God sent Messiah. You'll know the truth. He told them that he'd believed, gave mental agreement. He said, if you know, you continue in my word. That's where salvation comes is where through the preached word. You continue in my word, you shall know the truth. And what would the truth do? The truth shall set you free. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin death. Have you been made free from the law of sin and death? I hope that you have. If you hadn't, I pray that the Lord by his grace through his gospel will set you free and that freedom will be freedom indeed. Okay, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Appreciate your presence. Lord bless you and keep you through this next week. Kenny, if you would lead us in a closing prayer.